introduce Karen Kindness. Um, Karen is our team leader within uh, PPDU and uh, was was involved in the the recent uh, review, the survey that you all we all completed, um, and is here to talk about that today. When I say talk, I'm probably exaggerating somewhat because poor Karen has lost her voice. So we'll just have to see how it goes, but we're fingers crossed. So uh, over to you, Karen. Thank you very much. I'm just hoping that technology will make up for any of my deficits. So please, if you can't hear, just I'll see if I can fook her with the technology and make it a bit better. First of all, before I launch into the talk, I would like to say a huge thank you to you all. We had a really tremendous response to the survey, and that's all down to you guys. Um, it's really important going forward that we understand what folk are doing already so that we can plan effectively around how these roles evolve. So thank you very much for that. Also, I should say I'm really, really missing my chum Helen Gray, who was absolute um, partner in getting this work underway, and she's enjoying her holidays while I try and scratchy whisper to you about the results. Um, the background to this review, I have realised somewhat belatedly when I found out that Caroline Hiscox, who commissioned the review, um, has known our two <coughs> other speakers for about 10 years and was well aware of the work going on before I knew anything about it, that um, she wanted NHS Grampian to be a bit ahead of the curve and I think we probably are because we're getting in there with our benchmarking now. The review process, um, there's a steering group that has guided the review and that has senior representation um, from nurses through um, across all sectors in Grampian. Um, so Jenny chairing today um, for <coughs> MHLD, Linda who spoke to you this morning um, for the Murray IGB and practice nursing, June Brown who's in the audience and will close today um, for the other two IGBs and um, Caroline herself for acute was here yesterday. So we've had some uh, really powerful steer around what we were doing within the context of this review. What I'm going to do is do a little bit of background. It's quite a comprehensive set of slides, some of which I will skip over quite quickly because Eddie, for example, has talked in quite a lot more detail um, than I'll have time to do. But in terms of making this presentation available to folks, it will give them some pointers on where they might wish to follow up or indeed um, folks that haven't managed to come at all today. It will try and make sure that there's a, a very sort of clear thinking behind the presentation today. And the other thing that I will discuss very briefly is the next steps. In terms of background, most of you will probably be aware that nurse practitioner roles and clinical nurse specialist roles really started to take hold in the 80s. But as Linda alluded to earlier on, that was little pockets of people. It was not at all widespread, but that's kind of in terms of the history of the roles. Right throughout from that time to this, there never has been any overarching governance or regulation. And again, it's been pockets of good practice. There is very good guidance out there on what we should be doing, but no consistent <coughs> adherence to it throughout the boards. There's been variation in line management and supervision approaches, lack of consistency around what educational framework was used, lack of consistency over what CPD is appropriate. And as I said, good guidance is available. That was just a couple of examples there. And this Scottish national work is really, really welcome in terms of helping us to have a very clear approach that we take going forward. One of the things that exercised myself and Helen as long-standing acute nurses was the term specialist. We just got very confused about this. Um, and we've discussed our confusion with very many people trying to get our heads around it. And at the end of the day, I think it comes down to a terminology thing. In terms of the NMC, your specialist qualifications, which are recordable, 
are termed specialist because they're an additional qualification over and above your baseline registration. But they address both specialist and generalist roles. However, when we talk about advanced or advancing clinical practice roles, we use the term specialist to mean somebody who has a more focused um, direction to their work. So it means it's very difficult when you're talking about this to make sure you're talking about the same thing. So in the recordable qualifications section, you've got, for example, your V300 independent prescribing, um, your lecturer um, practice educator, who are, and the lecturer practice educator is absolutely an advanced role. It's just not in the clinical pillar of practice. <coughs> there is recommendation around the um, length of experience that folks should have before taking up role. But again, that's not consistently adhered to. And there's no requirement at the moment for us to obey that, if you will. There is, however, very good evidence that nurse specialists and CNSs provide really excellent care. It's cost effective and highly valued by the patients and their service colleagues. They work across a variety of acute and community settings and can be loan or team workers. And I think really importantly, there's a lot of evidence around the education and support that they provide for families. And if we think about 2020 vision and where we're trying to get in terms of promoting self-care, that's a really important component of any nursing role, but also within advancing practice. Advanced practice in NHS Scotland. Um, we're very clear that advanced practitioner posts are characterised in the clinical pillar of practice by high level clinical and technical competence and the NHS Education for Scotland um, Advanced Practice Toolkit has this benchmarking approach which really emphasises that it's a level of practice and is not about your particular role. However, the review that we've done is about clinical practice, so that is what we will focus on today. Most of you will be familiar with the four pillars of practice, and it's a key element of advanced and advancing practice that your practice reflects all four pillars. So as clinical practitioners, most of your time and energy will be spent on developing your clinical skills and on delivering clinical care, but we would be expecting you to have some contribution to leadership around the role, to facilitation of learning, and also to evidence use, research and development. And that maybe explains why the questionnaire was so long at 70 odd questions, because we were trying to capture what folks were delivering within all of the pillars as part of that questionnaire. Again, many of you will have seen this graphic, and what's interesting for me around it is that in terms of quantity of time spent against any particular aspect, the level five practitioner profile, if you will, looks very similar to what you would expect the advanced practitioner profile to look like. The bulk of their time is spent on clinical. It's just that what you do within that clinical pillar is obviously advanced over and above what you would be doing as a more junior nurse. Your level eight in MAP consultant role is more about influencing clinical practice and promoting quality within clinical practice and making sure that the best evidence and research is used to support it. Not so much in direct clinical contact, but very strong in leadership, evidence and education. The national work which Eddie has spoken to far better than I could, um, but for me there were some take home messages from that. <laughs> And a really, really key point of that is that going forward, what we do with this work sits very firmly within the NHS boards. And we need to take responsibility for that, working in line with the guidance that we've been given. And that's what hasn't happened in the past. A lot of the guidance has been there. We haven't worked appropriately with it. The other real take home message for me was about working with Scottish Government and um, our higher education colleagues 
to make sure that we get the right education for our practitioners. And from the phase two work, I think it's really exciting that they're going to be looking much more closely at how mental health roles advance district nursing and collaborating with the HEIs around how we evaluate impact, because that's not an easy thing to do, certainly <coughs> not in terms of quality. In terms of quantity, it's not so bad, but in terms of quality, it's quite a hard thing to do well. I'm not going to read out these definitions, both because of my scratchy throat and elsewise, but these are the oft-banded um, definitions. They are not particularly helpful, and that's why this it is really helpful that the paper that's come out from SEND, that's been ratified with a lot more detail in it, fleshes out these definitions. And I guess one of the other things for me is that the International Council of Nurses particularly, the master's degree is recommended for entry level. You're not stopping, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the career framework, again, most of you will be familiar with. The points I really want to make here, and it echoes what Eddie said, career framework level does not equal AFC banding. And that's really important when I come to the results later on. Um, Advanced roles are benchmarked at AFC 7 and above, and they will be level 7 and above. And that's in terms of the clinical practice. So you might have a higher banding because you're stronger in one of the other pillars. It may or may not be your clinical practice. So we're definitely not necessarily saying a banding is wrong um, when we look at some of these results. The range of underpinning principles, autonomous practice, critical thinking, high levels of decision making, problem solving, values based care and improving practice. And really that's where you see a lot of the other pillars creeping in there. You need that research and evidence to improve your practice. You need leadership to help improve values based care. You need to demonstrate what you want people to emulate. <coughs> So, Eddie said he's not doing specialist versus generalist. I patently am, <laughs> um, but I hope not in a bad way. It really is about questions. What do we mean by specialist? I talked a little bit about that earlier on. Do we mean one body system, one disease group, an area of practice? Generalist, what even does that mean? Uh, I thought the example from Cumbria was really interesting because if you think about our pre-registration training as nurses, we're already, quote, specialising compared to, for example, medical colleagues who do cradle to grave. They do everything in their, in their pre-registration training. We already subdivide ourselves into fields of practice, which presents challenges when you then want to look at further expanded practice in ANP roles, GP practices don't want you just to see adult patients, they want you to see kids, and they want you to see folk with psychological problems or mental health problems, as well as physical problems. So we are a little bit handicapped at the moment. The UK is fairly on its own around this. A lot of other countries do have a more comprehensive approach to pre-registration nurse training. <coughs> um, so where do we aim with that? And what are the implications for pre-registration moving forward? Blue sky thinking? Do we want to get rid of that old model of pre-registration training and have a more solid foundation? Again, most of you all have seen this diagram, but it's really just to emphasize the point that Specialist practice and generalist practice are not discrete, it's a continuum. You might have one individual practitioner who is very highly specialist. You might have somebody who is incredibly general, generalist. But you can have any mix in between, depending, <coughs> depending on what the needs of the patient are. The vertical axis is a bit easier to think about because we're all aware that whenever we come into a new role, we start out as a novice and 
we gain experience and expertise as we go. Right, this starts a little bit into the results. These are actually you guys' job titles, Wordled. For those of you who are not familiar with Wordle, you plug all the words into a little computer software program and the more often a word is repeated, the bigger it is. And it gives you a very nice visual of what's popping up most commonly. I don't think there's any huge surprises there except for maybe the loads and loads and loads of tiny words <laughs> which are representing all the different specialities that people are in. Just for your interest, there were over a hundred job titles returned. Um, but most of them obviously had nurse or advanced or practitioner or clinical somewhere in there. I'm going to let you read these. These were the specific review objectives. that makes sense? Why, why we would want to look at those things? We piloted in the cardiothoracic unit. They're quite a big unit in terms of the number of ANP and advanced roles they have within them. Um, there's two discrete groups within that. There's the surgical sport practitioners who work in theatre and intensive care. And there are the ward ENPs who look after the patients when they come up to the HDU and in the ward. Um, it took quite a long time to do the pilot because we were piloting the tools. Um, so they piloted that questionnaire and helped us to refine it. And in order to do that, we had one-to-one -one interviews with them all. <coughs> um, the report for that has been... Um, sorry, I don't think this is picking up as well as it should, is it? Can you still hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so there has been a report prepared on that, which we have unfortunately not been able to share with practitioners yet, and that's just a staff logistics thing, and we absolutely are going to do that, and I need to apologise again for not being in that place yet. Review progress. So, pilot complete. After the pilot was complete, we needed to identify respondents. This was a major, major challenge. Workforce data gave us 298 individuals. Just from eyeballing it, because myself and Helen know quite a lot of you, and there were a chunk of you just weren't on that information. So we went out via management structures, asking nurse managers to identify folks within that areas. Even that didn't work because what we had not appreciated in our naivety is that not everybody had a nurse manager involved in their line management structure. Some sit entirely out with that. So again, there were folks who weren't picking up. So we put out the globals and let folk, if you reckon you're in one of these roles, tell us about your role and we'll have that conversation. <coughs> Preliminary analysis is complete and it is fairly preliminary because you'll be aware from having completed it was a lot of data we asked for. So I'm going to go over the stuff that we've done so far, but there is more to come. And then, as I said earlier, we'll focus a little bit on what we do going forwards. So response rates, I told you a little bit about the background to how we identified respondents. When we collated all that information, both what we had from um, the ISD data, what we had from divisional structures, what we had from self-respondents. You get the July 16 line, so there's a really interesting spread there with a great chunk of practitioners in Division 1, which I'll show you in a slightly different form shortly. But we actually got to a total of 431 folk. That includes folk who self-reported that perhaps are not really sitting in primarily clinical posts, but I'll get to that later. But overall it gave us a response rate of 60 odd percent, which is pretty good for an online survey to be fair. There were some particular areas of interest in here. Pretty sure that the number of ENPs sitting in GP practices is much higher than that. 
um, but it's not that easy trying to capture them. Maybe wrong about that. Well, what do you think, Linda? <laughs> I think in the last couple of years, it's, it's come up. It's, mm. uh, I, but I don't think there are huge numbers. Yet. Okay. We're maybe not missing as many as we think. And especially for MHLD, there were six folks sitting there identified who were very clearly practitioners and quite a lot of folk who reckon they are in specialist roles. And I think nationally, that's an ongoing discussion. I don't think that has been clarified yet. And certainly within that service, um, they will have a very close look in light of the transforming nursing roles work and in light of the nursing, uh, the, na the ongoing national work, how should those roles be defined within mental health? What should those roles look like? Um, what roles are needed to help s serve the population that, that we're looking after? That gives you a, maybe a little bit of a better visual, um, starting with the tall pillar, which is Division 1 Medicine and Unscheduled Care, has approximately 20% of all the advanced and specialist practitioners. That's band 6 and band 7, because our review is wide. Surgical and a lo load of other ones there sitting around about the 10%, a bit less than Murray, as you would expect in doctors, Dr Gray's. And we move on to the community folks, very few in community hospital, quite a lot in community GP practice. Um, GMED, considering the area it covers, is actually quite few, isn't it? Um, and others, as I said, folks that maybe don't strictly um, fall into any defined area. They maybe have an NHS Grampian wide remit. They're not defined particularly by a, a geographical area of practice. A little bit more breakdown for mental health. You see quite a distribution, distribution there over the specialties within mental health and learning disability. Um, with the bulk sitting in adult mental health and the, I always get this wrong, it's that child and a, a child and adolescent, that's that. I keep thinking the A's for and and it throws me off. Um, community, again, quite a good spread there. Biggest chunk in Aberdeen City <coughs> and in GP practice, not insignificant number in Aberdeenshire um, and the rest distributed fairly evenly. Back to my lovely wiggles. Um, education and qualifications. These were what you reported as qualifications you already hold. So MSC quite big in there, bearing in mind what I said about wordles. Nursing very big, practitioner very big, registered pretty big, and then you're starting to scatter down to more nebulous things. If we look formally at what that means, you've got your diploma, it's your big red one, and this was a tick all that applied. So you would expect obviously everybody to have our pre-registration qualification, but depending on your age, that could be certificate, diploma, degree. Um, so you, it's unsurprising that's the biggest. Um, but there are a significant number in there of your Paleolithic full masters, there's PG diplomas, there's PG certs. So I think overall we're moving in the right direction. We asked if you were currently studying. A fair chunk of you said no. And there can be very good reason for that. Maybe you've just qualified and you're sitting with your freshly printed masters. I think it's not unreasonable to think you might want a wee break before we push you on to do more things. Um, but about a quarter of you are formally studying at the moment and a not insignificant number doing some form of CPD. Roughly half of you are on a formal master's programme quite a scattering there among the um, PG DIP, PG CERP and standalone modules. So a good range in there and mostly at the appropriate level. Your demographics. Um, if you were maternity law, you'd all be elderly prunes, wouldn't you? Because <laughs> most of you are over 45 <laughs> with a few youngsters in there. Um, Quite a few, 55 plus, a not insignificant number, 60 plus, 
and I know some of you are retired and coming back just for fun. <laughs> <laughs> Governance structures, we have talked about a bit. Again, there's recommendations, guidance available, and I think it's something that is good to be really clear about, that if you're working as a registered nurse in any capacity whatsoever, and you need that registration in order to practice, your governance structure goes through to your executive nurse director. There can be a lot of um, discussion within some circles about if you go into have a title that doesn't have nurse in it, like for I'll give you an example, advanced critical care practitioner, um, that you're no longer a nurse. I'll let you guess who might think you're no longer a nurse. <laughs> it's not the practitioners, I have to say. Um, so there is an ideal versus reality there. There's a lot of different thoughts out there, but it's just to be really clear that that's what the situation is and that we need to make that more clear and have a very strong nursing voice around that. And appraisal is a really, really important part of good governance because if you're not having those regular discussions about what your development needs are, um, what your services needs are, how can you develop professionally and safely? Your years qualified prior to starting in this type of role. Really reassuring to see that over 90% of you were the five years plus that is recommended. Bit of a smattering in there of other things. Um, no harm having a little bit of a smattering, but I balked a little bit at one and two years. I'm kind of hoping some of those were erroneous mouse clicks and people, um, <laughs> or a misunderstanding of the question. Um, but I have to say, I have some concerns about people coming fresh out of university. That my, Some of my university colleagues would debate that, um, but I'll be interested to hear in the workshops later on what you think about a reasonable minimum length of time is to be practising as a registered nurse before you undertake this type of role. Your last appraisal superficially maybe doesn't look great in light of what I said earlier, but you're better than the NHS Grampian average and you're better than the national average as well in terms of time since your last appraisal. Not saying we're not going to aim for perfect, and we should aim for perfect, um, but I think slipping into the just over a year is not necessarily a tragedy. Um, uh, it's an absolute tragedy if you've never had one. And that needs to be a fairly strong conversation, I think. Who performed your appraisal? Bearing in mind what I said about governance structure and lines of accountability. Um, really good that there's a strong nursing presence in there. Over 60% nurse manager directly involved. Team leader, normally speaking, would be a nurse, not always. Um, as Eddie said, if that nurse doing your appraisal does not have the uh, competence to assess you clinically, then you would expect to have somebody who can, and that would often be a medical person. Um, I think it's the folks out in working in GP practices that maybe struggle most with this. If there is not another registered nurse there that can work with them, and I think, Linda, you actually go and see some folks, don't you, yes, if I'm necessary. To me and, uh, yeah. Yeah. So Linda's just saying there that arrangements can be made, but it's about the practitioners being aware that that needs to happen, because if the practice manager is, doesn't have a nursing background, might not be aware of that. The GPs are often not aware of that, because it wouldn't occur to them to worry about it. <laughs> um, and so it is very much down to the practitioners understanding that themselves. This was just a small selection of the variety of daily activities. I tried to focus here on the ones that you would <coughs> expect if you're working in an advanced role, and particularly an advanced nurse practitioner role, would be a key part of that role. So I only took the, there were other options on the questionnaire, but what we represented there was orange is the daily, and the green is do not undertake. 
So if you look, for example, down near the bottom at patient history taking and clinical examination and assessment, quite a lot of you do do these things daily, but a not insignificant number, around about 20%, don't do it at all. And those are the sorts of things that make you wonder, is this really a clinical role or is this some other kind of role? <coughs> um, ditto with prescribing, but I'll deal with that in a little bit more detail later. And there's other things there, speaking to things like referral or discharge. So do you prescribe medications? Half of you do. And how do you prescribe? The majority of you do have your V300 independent prescriber. Is it? You're breaking up. I'm breaking up. Okay. Let me try holding it and see if that's better. Okay. I'm busting it. <laughs> Okay, so there are a few other qualifications in there, but a vast majority of you are independent prescribers. Again, I'll let you read this. This is particularly surgical procedures that some practitioners undertake. If you're like me, I didn't understand. Some of them had to Google them. <laughs> And then we asked about other procedures that folks thought were in advance. And bearing in mind again what I said about the Wordle, Wordle there's a lot of inserting going on <laughs> <laughs> out in advanced and specialist land. <laughs> other activities. Really nice to see patients large and at the centre there. Assessment, management, support, education. Some really, really good data came in there, which we need to delve into in a bit more detail. We also asked you about your concerns. As Eddie said, in these types of roles, advancing nursing practice, whether that's in a generalist or a specialist way or any mixture, if you're not feeling a bit uncomfortable at times, you're probably not actually advancing. You're static. Um, and it's no problem having a rest from time to time. But if we're keeping patients at the centre of what we do and trying to meet their needs as best we can, um, we probably need to be pushing forward, but in a safe and structured way with appropriate governance. So thinking what I said earlier about the four pillars, we asked a selection of questions across the four pillars. So this is some of the response around your contribution within the evidence and research. Um, only about 20% have un actually undertaken your own research study and I appreciate for a fair chunk of you that's a work in progress, you haven't actually completed yet. But a fair range um, of contribution there to other aspects which would be utilising evidence like developing protocols and guidelines to support your practice. Um, some of you actually leading on that work for your service. Key outcomes for your role, I said earlier, this is a difficult one. Um, not so bad quantitatively, but qualitatively. I think it will be really good to have the support of the HEIs and um, collaboration between boards as well on what that might look like. So some of you are in green, about a quarter of you, um, but a third, definitely not. Chunk of you not sure. <laughs> Still thinking about it. Auditing and clinical trials within your service, two-thirds yes, which is really good. Um, a third, nope, not at the minute. And these are the types of um, things you described, so unsurprisingly a lot of audit, but looking at patient outcomes, satisfaction, treatment. Education pillar, oh, nearly pushing towards 90% of you absolutely involved in education in some way, shape or form, and I'll break that down a bit for you. Only a few of you not. Ad hoc, unsurprisingly, in green is the most. We're opportunists as nurses, aren't we? We take our, take our chance to educate when we can. Um, but a lot of more planned and structured activity there. So planned teaching for call for colleagues, course instructor, teaching day, study days, formal in-service training and university lecturing. So a really good range there. 
And again, looking at your descriptors around teaching, um, a lot actually teaching quite a lot of self-management in there. Um, when I think about the data that came through, really quite a lot of support for folk to try and manage their own conditions better. Your leadership contribution, often one of the most thorny ones in this type of post, especially if you're in a lone post. Um, but some teams there, so some line management responsibility in there with that responsibility for appraisal and staff development and an absolute opportunity for you to demonstrate leadership and involvement in service re redesign planning how your service moves forward um, fairly good contribution in there but we'd like to see more we'd like to have a stronger voice in that I think as nurses so a lot of you reckon you are involved um, and a really, really wide variety of things there that folk are doing. Level of practice. This is a layer of analysis further that we went into and possibly flawed. These are some questions for you. I said earlier that it is becoming increasingly difficult to separate out advanced specialist, advanced generalist, there's a lot of muddy water in the middle. But we had a stab. And we also had a stab at differentiating level of practice between level 6 and level 7 on the career framework. And the main criteria we used to make that distinction were the criteria used within um, the framework that Eddie described. So if you're going to have the descriptor advanced and be working at level seven in terms of clinical practice, you should be making your own assessment and diagnosis, treatment plan, and following through on that with prescribing or referral. Um, the discharge and so forth is a little bit more thorny. Absolutely, in an ideal world, that becomes a, a whole integrated way of working for ANPs. Some services are there, some aren't. Um, but if you're ticking most of the rest of the boxes, at the minute, we could regard that as a work in progress, especially within acute. I think it's, it's a lot easier in GP or out of hours where you've got a defined episode of care. But when you've got a consultant responsible for a whole inpatient stay, it's kind of understandable that they maybe want the last say on whether they discharge or not. But um, in terms of you going to see that patient to sort out particular problems for that episode of, of their inpatient stay, you might very well be making the decision. For example, as a night nurse practitioner, you're called to see somebody, you go see them, you sort them out, you have, to, you have sorted that episode of care within the wider need for their admission. Um, so again, just a really interesting distribution there. Some of the mismatching, it does not, we are not suggesting, I need to be really, really clear about that. We are not trying to say your banding is wrong if you're sitting as a specialist in seven. It's just about the way the roles are described and how we analyse them. But there is some food for thought there and there's maybe some further discussion would be interesting. Sorry, I should have said, the Reds are folks that were patently not primarily um, advanced or specialist practice. For some reason, they had a burning need to answer this survey and their role was just not anything like any. <laughs> Uh, so if you excluded them, that's what your breakdown looks like. The navy and the dark purple are your general specialists at advanced level, roughly a third, roughly two thirds operating around the level six on the framework in terms of their clinical practice. So next steps. We need to build on the work that we've done so far with this review. Um, we need to get that NHSG work together and agree as a board how we implement the national work. Uh, there will be leads within each sector who will help shape that along with yourselves. And this is the first of hopefully quite a lot of opportunity for you to help shape what we do with an NHS Grampian. So the leads, 
Um, for acute sector will be um, Chief Nurse Fiona Robertson. For primary care, Linda, who's here with us today. And for MHLD, Jenny Gibb, who's here with us today. And Caroline Hiscock, as um, Commissioner of the Review, will have her hand in there as well, I'm quite sure. Um, so the opportunities to engage and contribute, obviously today, very particularly at the workshops this afternoon, You'll all get a chance to participate in all of the um, four workshops, and that is workshops. You're going to be working. This is not us talking to you. This is you discussing your thoughts, concerns, what you think is the way forward. And the forums. We've got with us here today Ian Mitchell, who will take sign up for anybody who wants to join the Advanced Nursing Practice Forum. And I think somebody is going to be at the desk for CNS, um, but there's certainly sign-up sheets there. Same desk. We're not at all convinced in our heads that these need to be separate forums. We're trying that way for a start. We may well amalgamate. Um, I think certainly as me and Helen have ploughed plough through this work, there's a lot more similarities and differences at the end of the day. So. We'll, we'll try it this way and see how it goes, but particularly if you guys are feeling, no, we'd rather work together on this, that's absolutely fine. This is the diagrammatic representation of the governance structure in acute, and I think there is one which is more or less the same for the IGBs, um, so it, but it just gives you a picture of how you can formally contribute. So the forums that I have just mentioned have a formal seat at various levels in the governance structure. So the chair from those forums can represent you, your concerns, your thoughts, your plans formally within the NHS Grampian governance structures. So if you want to have a voice, it's really important that you sign up, you go along and you contribute to the work. Is that enough of a promo, Ian? <laughs> okay. Um, so that's how that works. This is the last bit really I'm going to take any time at all over. This is a pictorial representation of, in broad strokes, what we would like to see within NHS Grampian. With the patient health care requirements at the centre of our thinking and the centre of the way we develop our services, and that the practitioner we provide at any point that they need care, that the practitioner we provide for that care is the right one. So when we're service planning, we need to be thinking what skill set we need to deliver particular care. And this is one of the places you would want to think about, for example, PA versus CNS or advanced nurse practitioner. Currently, they're not prescribers. So if the service you want to deliver requires a prescriber and a PGD won't do, you need a nurse. Okay. <laughs> um, so that service planning should be robust. If the right role is one of the varieties of advancing nursing role, then you need to make sure you've got a governance framework in there, we've got an educational framework in there, and we've got robust workforce planning and that's succession planning as well. You'll have seen from the demographic, we need some folks coming behind to fill those shoes. When you that doesn't work unless it's stitched together with management and leadership and good communication. But I think the governance structure I showed you with a strong voice for advanced practice in there will give you that. The workshops this afternoon are really all about what goods looks like. We've given you quite a lot of information and Mark's going to give you a bit more. But it's about you starting that journey of thinking about for your roles, what does good look like in terms of governance, workforce planning, education and service planning. And we will explore that with you this afternoon. 